Hey everyone, so as you've probably heard, Kubernetes 1.14 just released. I was looking over the change log last night and saw some really cool, or a really cool change to kubeADM around how highly available control planes can be bootstrapped. This is something that a lot of folks have been wanting for a while, and it looks like it's headed in a really cool direction. So I wanted to make a blog post about it and record a video. If you are interested in kind of following along or maybe even just reading through the content rather than watching this video, I'll have a link to my blog in the bottom, which has all the steps I go through and also descriptions of how things are working. So let's talk a little bit about kubeADM to level set for a sec. kubeADM is a tool that allows you to bootstrap Kubernetes. It doesn't worry about things like infrastructure provisioning or complex config management. It just does its job pretty well, which is how do I bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster? One of the primary commands you'll see run, ran with cube ADM is the init command, because the init command is how we initialize a cluster. When you run init, it's going to, and, and to back up, you do need to have some things on the master node already. For example, you have to have a kubelet installed, cube ADM installed, a couple system configuration things have to be in place, but that's all documented in the Kubernetes docs. Nonetheless, if you've got all that and you run kubeadm init, it's going to start the Kubernetes control plane. This is the API server, the scheduler, the controller manager as static pods. And all that means is it puts them in a specific directory on the host so that when the kubelet starts up, it knows to start them as containers. It doesn't require a whole Kubernetes system to get those initial containers bootstrapped. And by default as well, it will also run etcd. So there is a way to externalize etcd, but for all intents and purposes with this example, we're gonna run in a stacked master mode where we have the Kubernetes control plane components and the etcd components co-hosted on the same node. So not only will we be joining Kubernetes components together, but we'll actually be joining etcd together as well. Once all that's in place, it can deploy the cube proxy daemon set, which sets up IP table rules or interacts with IPVS, and then core DNS, which provides our cluster DNS. Now, once you run kube adm init, you're gonna have the ability to join worker nodes. So a command will pop out, you can run that command on other hosts, and then those worker nodes can be added to the cluster. It's not too dissimilar of a process for master nodes. However, master nodes have conventionally required a little bit more orchestration. You've had to worry about moving their certificates and key information around, and that's added a little bit more complexity to the configuration management side of things. We're looking for an experience that's maybe a little bit closer to the easy setup for worker nodes. And this is where the new feature comes in. So now kubeadm init has an experimental upload certs flag. So what this is gonna do is it's still going to create, assuming we're doing init, all the main components that we talked about a second ago, but it's also going to create an encryption key. That 32-byte encryption key is going to be used to fully encrypt the data inside of something called kubeadm-certs. kubeadm-certs is all of the etcd, API server, and more certificates and keys that are needed to add new masters. It's all uploaded into the kube API server as a secret, but it's been completely encrypted by this encryption key. So while if the API server was exposed, you could theoretically get this file, the data inside of it should be encrypted by a key that exists completely independent of Kubernetes. Another cool thing about it is a kubeadm token is created. And what this token does is it basically sort of becomes like the owner of that kubeadm secret cert, so that when the TTL is hit for the kubeadm token that gets generated, the kubeadm certs also get deleted. So you kind of have this two-phase thing where the data is fully encrypted inside of Kubernetes for the certs. And also there's only a certain window of time by default an hour that the cert file is available to the cluster. Once you've done your initialization, you now have the ability to go in and join new master nodes. kubeadm join is also the command you use for worker nodes. And previously we had the experimental control plane flag that we could add in. But what's cool about this now is we've introduced, or, the, or SIG cluster lifecycle has introduced a certificate key flag. And this is going to enable us to say, I wanna join you as a master. And here's the key you can use when you pull down those secrets to decrypt all the PKI assets put it on the master node and join the node itself. So it keeps things pretty simple when adding new control planes. So I'm actually gonna walk through an example of how this works. Again, if you wanna check out the blog in the description, it has details of how all these pieces are put together and also all the steps I'm going through. The key thing to know about my setup is I'm running three masters. The only thing I've done on these masters aside from play around in general is I've gone in and done all of the installing kubeadm steps. So that link will be in the description for that 
documentation guide. There's some things you need to install up front and some pieces you need to make sure are configured on your host so that you can run kubeadm. And then additionally, I have a load balancer virtual machine. And this virtual machine is going to provide the load balancer on top of all the API servers. All right, so getting right into it. I've got some of my IPs down here in the bottom right for convenience so we can kind of keep track of what I'm in. I'm gonna start off by editing the load balancer. So if I uh, go into the load balancer at this IP address, so that's gonna be the 170 IP address. Just so you can keep track of where I'm at conceptually, you can see 170 is right here, so it's easy to tell what we're in. And we're just gonna get into sudo. So here's the deal. This is just supposed to be a simple load balancer. I wanna be able to use it so I can show you the part we actually care about, which is kubeadm. So we're gonna set up a simple Nginx container that's set to TCP proxy through to these master nodes at 160 through 162. To do this, we're gonna make a directory inside of Etsy called Etsy Nginx, again, a very crude approach. And then we're gonna go in and do Etsy Nginx, nginx.conf. Now I've pre-written the configuration file so that you don't have to be bored watching me try to type in an Nginx config, which would not go well, I can promise you. And I will just paste that in real quick. So we've got that and some extra character. But this is basically what the config looks like. Now, I'm no Nginx expert. Basically, all this is trying to do is say, hey, forward requests when I'm listening on 6443 to 160, 161, and 162. There's better ways to do this. This probably could be wrong altogether. Also, it's doing no good health checks. It's just basically seeing if it can access the host on the port, which is not good. You don't want like blips of that load balancer being thrown off. It should do more in-depth stuff. So nonetheless, this will be our simple example so we can at least get something fronting our API servers. Now, if you were doing this example in AWS, US, you could probably just use an ELB or something else. But again, I'm doing it all local for the sake of simplicity on a bunch of VMs. Cool. So now we need to run Docker as well. And I've also got that command in place. So I'm going to show you that. And I'll explain kind of what it's doing here. So we're going to do Docker run of name proxy. We are going to mount in the Nginx configuration file that we just set up. And we're going to port forward from the host on 6443 to 6443. We'll start that container up. And if we do a Docker PS, we can now see there is an Nginx container ID set up inside of here. Great. So I'll go ahead and exit out of this particular virtual machine. And depending on your setup, you may have to figure out how to access the IP that you've just set up the load balancer on. But in my case, I can directly call these. So if I do 176443, while I don't get a good response back, I do get a response that shows me I'm, I'm reaching an IP, I'm reaching a server. So in this case, Nginx basically can't access or get any data out of these master nodes, which is exactly where I want to be at this point in time. Okay. So now it's time, if we bounce back, to basically run this kubeadm init command. I want to run on my first master node and set up all of these different components and make sure I have this experimental upload certs in place so that all of these components can also be added and I can basically join new master nodes. So let's go ahead and SSH into 160 here. All right. And once we are inside of 160, we are going to also get into sudo or root and we're going to make a directory in Etsy Kubernetes called kubeadm. And I'm going to make a file in there called Kubernetes kubeadm kubeadm config.yaml. Now these config files are basically going to provide kubeadm init with some extra instructions as to how it should bootstrap. I've pre-written this out as well, but I'll explain what it does. So this is not doing anything too complex, but the reason I need this config file is for two settings that I am altering in my environment. One is I need to make sure it knows that the control plane endpoint shouldn't be the host I'm running init on, but instead should be the load balancer I'm going to be accessing the API server through. Secondly, I need to specify a pod subnet because in my case, I'm gonna be using Calico as my CNI plugin. Additionally, I'm specifically setting it to 18 because I want to make sure that the IP space the pods take up does not overlap with my load balancer and, and my masters really as well. That would be a bit of a mess. So I'm specifically setting this. If you're going to use Calico, you'll need a pod subnet. Your, your CIDR may or may not vary depending on what your setup is. So we'll put that in place, kubeadm config. And now it's just a matter of running a NIT. So if we break down to make it clean, we'll do a kubeadm init. 
and two flags. The first flag we're going to do is config, and config is going to be set to Kubernetes, kubeadm, kubeadm config.yaml. And then at the very end here, important, we need to include experimental upload certs so that we include all of those black boxes in the slide, which is the encryption key, the certificates in the secret, so on and so forth. So we'll go ahead and run kubeadm init, and that will start up. Now I've preloaded all the images, so most of these things are going to bootstrap fairly quickly. We're not going to wait for it to download the manifest over the internet. So we'll give it just a moment here, and we should have a cluster that is up and running. Once this cluster is up and running, one of the key things that does not get bootstrapped, if we go back here, is obviously no CNI plugin has been set up because we want the flexibility to be able to choose our own CNI plugin. That shouldn't be a concern of Cube Admin per se. So once we do get this set up and we have an API server available, I'll be using Cube Cuddle to insert Calico into this cluster. All right, now we're set up. Couple pieces of information that we should care about. The first thing we should care about is it says you can join any number of control plane nodes. So this is that change that's important to us. And it gives us a command that we can theoretically run on the control plane nodes. So let's go ahead and save this real quick. So I'm gonna call this cjoin.shell and don't worry too much about what it contains. We'll talk about it. I'm just gonna store it so I don't lose it. Also, you can see that you can join any number of worker nodes as well. And this is what those of you who have used kubeadmin are used to. You can copy this, paste it on nodes, and then when the nodes run this command, they'll be able to join the cluster as standard worker nodes. And then lastly, we have a command that will set up kubectl on this host. So this is kind of nice because we're gonna wanna be able to query. So I'm gonna set this up right now. If I back out to my main user, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure, because I've been playing around on this host, I don't have any dot cube stuff, then I'm gonna paste in that same grouping of commands that it mentioned. And if we do cube cuddle get nodes, we now have one node 160 as a master and it is status not ready. It's not ready because the CNI has not been initialized. If we were to get pods for namespace cube system, we'll see that things like core DNS aren't started. And if we looked at the kubelet, we'd see complaints about the lack of CNI initialization. So let's go ahead and set up our cluster to have Calico as the CNI plugin once, once I learn how to type clear into the command line. So how do we do this? So it's just gonna be a cube cuddle apply. And I actually have a file in place that I'm going to use here. So this is gonna be the Calico URL. Now the reason I'm using my own Calico gist URL, and this is also the URL I use in the blog post as well, is because I've modified the CIDR of the default Calico deployment to match the pod CIDR you saw me set up in the cube ADM configuration. So just a, a note, you could, if you match the CIDR for what is there by default with your pod subnet, you might not need to use my specific file, but if you wanted to use my specific file, it's not changing much, it's literally just changing the CIDR. So now that we've got that initialized, we can go ahead and do a cube cuddle get pods again for the namespace cube system. You can see Calico node is now online and our core DNS pods are too, which means if we do a cube cuddle get nodes, we now have a node that is ready at 160, which is exactly what we want. All right, so we have one node up, we've achieved this setup. Now, let's look at joining our other worker node, which is gonna be the kubeadm join. So I'm gonna show you joining first, then we'll talk about where all these pieces are behind the scenes and, and kind of take a look at them inside. All right, so obviously the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is SSH into that worker node. So this will be on 161. Now I'm gonna sudo in again so that I can do some privileged things. All right, good deal. So we're inside of 161 now, which is not part of the cluster. Now, you may remember there was a command that got ran that was, or sorry, a command that was outputted to us that said, hey, run this on a host if you wanna join it as a control plane node. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this join.sh and I'll also make it executable when we leave the file. Um, join.sh, good deal. Cool, and let's just examine this for a moment. Sorry, it's a bit ugly. Let's, let's add some breaks in so it's a bit easier to read. So one, two, there, that looks good. And then one more break right here and it should be a bit more clean. Okay, 
There we go, a little bit easier to read, right? So obviously the first thing kubeadm join is doing is it needs to know, hey, if I'm gonna join, where do I go to talk to the API server about joining? Well, here's an IP address for you. Additionally, it has a token available, which is a token that's available for 24 hours. Those of you who have used kubeadm, this is the token you would use by default to join worker nodes. It's important to note that this is not the same token as the token being used to bind the cert to a one hour TTL. We'll talk more about that relationship in a moment, but this is not a node joining token. It's simply a token set up so that we can ensure kubeadm certs have a short time to live. They get swept up eventually. We also have the experimental control plane uh, flag inside of here, which is gonna say, hey, join me as a master node. And then the new flag certificate key, because obviously if we pulled all that cert information in, but didn't actually decrypt it, it wouldn't do us much good to have encrypted PKI assets everywhere. So that's it. We'll go ahead and save that up. And then I'll also just open up one more buffer here and I will do, make it bigger so you can see. We're gonna SSH back into one, oh geez, 160. And I'm just gonna run a watch on get nodes real quick. So we'll do a cube cuddle, get nodes, cool. So we've obviously got one master here. Now, if we go up to 161 and we run a join command, it's gonna go through all the pre-flight checks. And I've already pulled all the images down to save you the headache of watching the paint dry. Once this gets set up, it should be added into this list of nodes. Now I'll warn you, my load balancer again is not doing proper health checking. So it's possible we'll see some like end of file blips as the new API, there you go, as the new API server comes online, gets accessed, but doesn't quite work the way you need it to um, because the API server is not fully online yet. So again, um, if this were an actual environment, we would definitely wanna do a better job at setting up the load balancer with proper health checks. But now, as you can see, we've got a pretty similar output and we now have 161 registered as a master node. That was it. So in a matter of minutes, we were able to add another master in and we're now highly available. So you could see how plugging this into automation would be a fairly simple thing to do. All right, now we've obviously got one more master node we wanna join in. And if I was doing this in automation, I'd obviously have the next master node join pretty quickly because for etcd to really be beneficial as far as like high availability goes, we need at least three of them because it works in kind of odd numbers with the RAF um, consensus algorithm. So to make this possible, I wanna just go through a slightly different use case to show you how this would work. Um, let's, let's start by kind of diving into what's been happening behind the scenes. And I think it'll make that use case a little bit more clear. So first things first, I'm on uh, 160 again. And if I come back into root and do a kubeadm token list, you'll notice there's two tokens. The first token is 2MPEF, so 2MPEF0. And then there's another token in here, which is CK2EGQ. So we'll do that. Now it's important to note that this is the one hour TTL one, and this is the 24 hour TTL one, or in this case, it looks like it has 23. So this CK2EGQ is what we were using to run the kubeadm join command. That's a token that has the appropriate groups and setup in order to allow another node to join into the cluster. 2MPEF0 is really just the owner of the secret that we've been talking about, the owner of this secret here. So the existence of 2MPF0 is really only to bind this by time. We don't use it in the join command. And the reason I call that out is I got a bit confused about that because I didn't read the docs well. And I got really confused why that token wasn't working for me. Um, but reality is that this token is just bound to the kubeadm secret, which it's actually kind of explicitly calls out here. It says proxy for managing TTL for the kubeadm certs secret. Another way we can kind of correlate to MPEF0 is if we go back to kubectl and we do a get secrets, um, secrets on the namespace cube system and we ask for cube ADM certs and we ask for it to be YAML, I'll pipe it through less. Now inside of this file, we're gonna have a bunch of the certificate information and key information. Remember it is encrypted, so without that key, I'm not gonna be able to do much with it. But if we go to the very bottom, you'll notice that there is a section that says name under owner references. And you'll notice that the owner is 2MPEF0, which is our one hour token. So you can see kind of the correlation there. And once that token expires, this can then get swept up and go away. All right, so the reason I give you that background, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 
not a good cough. Okay, so the reason I give you that background is because if you wanted to hypothetically add another master node in, but you did not have, um, you did, you already had the cluster running. You didn't want to run the full init. This is something we can do as well. So to kind of prep you here, I'm going to do a cube ADM token list one more time. And what we're going to do is a cube ADM token delete, and we will get rid of each of these tokens. So first we'll get rid of 2MPEF0. Then we'll get rid of the next one, <clears throat> CK2EGQ. Cool. And if we do a cube ADM token list, we now have no more tokens. So I'll go ahead and erase these out of here because they don't mean anything to us anymore. And this is where we're going to talk about the cube ADM init phase. So phases in cube ADM allow you to just call out a certain piece of the puzzle of that command. So when we do a cube ADM init end to end, it's going to do everything from bootstrapping all of the components to setting up the certs and, and, and so on. But all we want to do in this case, since since Kubernetes is already running, is we want to redo the upload certs piece. We want to recreate an encryption key, and this will be another unique encryption key. We want to re-upload kubeadm certs and give it a brand new token since we deleted its existing token. Token, And then we want to join a node. So basically, we don't want to do the whole init. We just want to do part of it. And that's exactly what we're going to do with master three, just to kind of show that off. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'm going to exit out and let's SSH into 162. So this is theoretically master node three. We'll get into sudo here. All right, great. So now that we're in master node three, <coughs> sorry again, hopefully you're not wearing headphones. Um, we're going to use kubeadm and we're going to do init phase and the init phase will be upload certs. All right, now arguments. As we had mentioned, in order to do upload certs, we also need to call out the experimental upload certs flag inside of here as well. So we're gonna do experimental upload certs. Cool, we'll run that. And now it will do just that phase. So if we back up here, let's see here, failed to load admin config, cube config, cube ADM, phase upload certs let's see kubernetes admin conf let's see here let's see kubernetes i'm not sure if i messed around with this host at all so let's try that one more time execution phase upload certs failed to load admin config Oh, yeah, here's the problem. Um, I am trying to run upload certs on my 162 host, which would definitely not make sense. So if we SSH into 160 again, or we could do this on 161, now we can run the command. So again, a little bit of a, a brain fart there. Obviously, we need to be on a host that already has all of the Kubernetes bits installed and up. So if we do kubeadm init phase, and the init phase that we do in here is upload certs. And then we go in and do the experimental upload certs. So experimental upload certs. Now there's gonna be an admin config for it to use and communicate with the API server. So what it gives us back here is an encryption key, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and grab this encryption key because we're definitely gonna need it later. So let's call it key.txt. I'll paste it in here and save it. All right, and it also mentions, hey, I also uploaded the kubeadm certs to the cube system namespace because obviously it's gonna have to upload it with the new encrypted key as, you know, as the data so that we can pull it down and decrypt it with this new key. So that's looking good overall. Now, if we do a cube ADM token list again, we're gonna see now we have 1MYW01, a one hour that's also acting as the proxy. So like we talked about, that's this guy here, which is great. We want that for the keeping a window to how long this cert is available or secret is available. However, we need a token that's gonna let us join worker or master nodes. So just like you may have done for worker nodes in the past, we still need to run a kubeadm token create inside of here. 
And token create has a couple different arguments that you can put in. The first thing that we're going to do with token create is we're going to start off by setting a TTL. And that TTL will be set to 10 minutes because after we join this last master, I just kind of want it to go away. And then if we back up or go down rather, uh, we will also add in a print join command, which is really nice because it's going to give us an output that we can effectively use to craft the join command for the control plane. Enter that in. And then obviously this will be very helpful to us as well. So I'm going to get rid of that C join that we had before. And then I'm going to make another one, C join, uh, vim C join dot sh, paste that in just for saving it and not forgetting it. All right, now that we've done this on 160, on not 162, which is what I messed up, we are going to SSH onto 162. All right, now this will probably make kubeadm a lot less confused. So if we get into root once again, what we're going to do here is we're going to examine that join command. So let's start there. We're going to do join.sh, and I will go ahead and chmod it to make it executable in join.sh. Great. Now let's break this up real quick to make sure it's a little bit easier for us to conceptualize and read. Uh, we'll go there. That looks good. Get that. Okay. So this obviously looks like less information than the kubeadm join we did for the other control plane component. The kubeadm join here is once again going to go through that load balancer. It's got a token. In this case, it has VRK9Y5, which is different from that one hour TTL token, right? This is a token that can actually be used to join nodes. The discovery token CA cert hash, really nice that that command for the print kind of pulled this out for us. Otherwise, we'd have to do some weird stuff potentially with OpenSSL to get this information out of um, the CA on the API server, but it's done for us. Now, obviously, we need to do more because this is more of how you would join a worker node. So the more things we need to do, the first piece we need to do is we need to say experimental control plane. So we need to make sure it knows, hey, I'm joining as a control plane node inside of this cluster. Now, the other thing we need to do is, once again, if we were to hypothetically pull out all these kubeadm certs, they'd be encrypted, right? So we need to make sure that we're specifying that new flag, the certificate key. And certificate key is what I put inside of key.txt. So let's go ahead and grab that out of here and paste it in. And that's it. Now we have a kubeadm join command that will be capable of joining a control plane uh, component. So save that up, and then if we pop back, we should now be able to run the join command and see this join. So let's do the same thing. We'll create another buffer down here and set SSH into 160, 160 o, or just 160, and make sure we type in the password right. There we go. All right, and we're gonna do another watch on get nodes. So we have a two node cluster, including 160 and 161. Let's go ahead and run the join shell command. Um, and let's make sure that I have no typos. Experimental, exper, exper, it, whoa. It's harder to type when you're being recorded. Experimental control plane. Save that up, run join. Pre-flight checks are gonna go through. And once again, all the images are preloaded. Once this finishes, again, we might see a blip because the load balancer is not set up in a very rigorous way, but eventually we should see 162 join the cluster. And now we should have a three node highly available Kubernetes cluster using some of these new kubeadm principles. So there's our end of file blip. We're now going through saying not ready. So we'll see if this pops back up in a sec. Looks like some things are going through. Now we're ready, flipped over to a master, we're good to go. So we've got in a one up for 18 minutes, one up for 12, and one up for 20 seconds. We now have a three node cluster, which is pretty cool. So we'll exit out of this top buffer. And if we do a cube cuddle, get pods for the namespace cube system once again, let's just do a watch on this so we can kind of watch it happen. You'll notice some things are probably initializing for us, right? So we've got another Calico node daemon set instance that is going to be hopefully ready pretty soon here. Uh, you'll also note we have, notice we have a three node etcd cluster now, which is great. So we have 
these nodes of etcd participating in quorum it makes us far more resilient in this stacked mastered model um, now we've got the Calico node that's online. As time goes on, we're gonna see things like the API server mirror pod show up here. So we've got an API server on 160, 161, 162. You'll get mirror pods for the scheduler, a mirror pod for the controller manager as well. So that's all in place. And core DNS is looking good. So now we have a highly available cluster. So overall, I hope you found this pretty helpful. Um, I was really excited to see this feature set in 1.14. I know a lot of folks will like to build their automation around it because it makes the control plane bootstrapping that much easier. Um, and a big shout out to the people in SIG cluster lifecycle that made this possible. It's really, really cool. I'm really looking forward to using it myself and also seeing projects like CubeSpray and Cluster API be able to reuse this work in order to set up their own um, highly available control planes as well. So again, if you enjoyed this, um, you can check out the blog in the description that will describe how all of these different pieces are set up. And if you do have any ideas for other topics you'd like to hear about with Kubernetes or even Linux, I'm trying to make more of this content as time goes on. So I'd love some ideas of, of different topics that you think would be interesting to create. So thanks again and enjoy 114.